I thought what we'd start with is more of a personal journey, okay? Because I'm a firm believer that on this, it's about the personal journey as well as the hard things that you do from a technical and metrics point of view. And I'm going to talk about some of the organisations here. These are organisations that I've, I've, I've worked in and, and, and passed through over the years. Um, and I do not stand here on behalf of those organisations at all. This is sort of my personal experiences and what brought me to this topic. If I think back to um, healthcare and life sciences years and years ago when I was working in that space, the most important thing in that product cycle was about making sure that the drugs, the medicines, they got made accurately to the right quality and they got to places on time, right? And they got there in full because people's lives depended on it. So it's all about the effectiveness of the supply chain. And cost was an important thing, but resilience was much more important. And back then, sustainability wasn't discussed, right? It just wasn't a topic that we talk about today. But the work that we were doing then and was called operational excellence. And some of you might know it as um, Six Sigma. People talk about it today. So it's like process improvements. Like you look through all of the steps of the process and you think, how can I improve each bit along the way to either remove some waste or remove duplication, improve the quality of that product? And then ultimately, you can do it quicker. You can do it more resilient each time. But also by doing that, you take out some cost along the way because you're just doing less steps. And often it's logistical steps. And so you take out some carbon, funnily enough, as well, because you take out some energy usage as you go along. And naturally, you get some cost reduction as well. So you're kind of getting costs, lining up with what the organization needs, which is resilience. And along the way, you're reducing your carbon. Now, back then, this wasn't talked about. But I, I remember thinking, there's got to be a little bit more to this. This seems like you know, bigger than just a cost exercise. A few years later, at BT, and for those of you who've ever worked in IT and telecoms, you'll know it's incredibly low margin, very fast. And for years and years, those organizations have been on cost reduction exercises. And there's only so much you can do. You can RFP, you can tender, you can change suppliers, et cetera, et cetera. But at some point, you have to think, well, what do we do next? And the work here was around energy reduction, right? Because you've got big network kit. If you can reduce the energy, that you consume and you can change the settings and you can buy new technology, you can save some money. But guess what? You can also reduce your carbon footprint. But again, it's not the driver. The driver is, I need to save some cost. Actually, a byproduct is, you're doing that. And the connection to an organization in IT and telecoms is that the products that you sell are about connecting people. They're about doing the complete opposite of what today is. And then I'm talking about a world before the last two years as we know it, so a world where everything was physical. The product you sell would be teleconferencing, it would be hybrid working, da da da, da. So you connect that lower cost of carbon sale with the work that you're doing in the supply chain as well. And that becomes a really nice connection through the organization of the work that you can do. In aerospace and defense, it's a really different place. The products are high performance, high specification. They're very difficult to change. They will take years and years to change a specification. And so that isn't the important thing. But there is a connection with a different type of sustainability, which is around job creation, skills and labor shortages, particularly in the UK, creating employment opportunities for individuals who are uh, needs not in employment, education, or training in parts of the country over a long period in aerospace and defense um, procurement work. And the work that we did there was around that and building that into a supply chain. Again, a really nice connection with skill shortages gaps and technology transfer um, in the country. So those are kind of like my thoughts as over the last few years uh, in, in terms of my background. And I'll come back to um, the Paris bit there and then nationwide where I am today. But in 2015, this was probably my most, you know, everyone has a few moments in their life where they think, oh, you know, that changed me or that made me think a slightly different way. You'll see there's a chap on the left there, like second one in from the left, who has darker hair than I have, and in fact has more hair than I have now. Life has been hard. 
over the last seven years, in particular the last two. But this is me and Yale with this great group of beautiful people from around the world. And I was privileged to be able to go on an 18 month to two year transformation exercise and an immersion into sustainability through the WBCSD, which is World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And I did this on behalf of BT at the time, and all those people are from, we're still in touch, they're all from different companies all around the world. And our CSO at the time, this Chief Sustainability Officer, could send a person on this. And he was really smart about it, and he thought, I'm not gonna send one of my sustainability team on this because they all buy into it, right? This is their thing, what, what, what difference am I gonna get? I'm going to send one of our senior procurement individuals. So I went on this, an absolute skeptic. Right? So I'd come from cost down, quarter on quarter, and I went on this thing. And I got to go to Yale, and I saw, um, I, I met speakers, you know, people who, who, who think hugely on um, sustainability issues, absolute world greats talking about oceanography and all the issues that we're facing in our, in our planet. And I completely converted to this topic, right, this agenda. Not because the organization is telling me to do it, but because my personal journey, and as a human, I can see these things are going on around us, and I personally wanted to see how I could apply that to my work going forwards. When I came back um, after, after that, one of the things that um, the team set up was and the BT Better Future Supply Forum, where we started to look at what we could do with individual suppliers in terms of carbon reduction and also um, less use of plastic. So even like thinning down a millimetre of plastic and, and sort of, you know, on, on some of our products and um, re reducing cost and also reducing usage, getting down to the real details and building collaborative teams between sustainability, procurement organisation, finance, and any other key contributor within the organization. And ultimately, it's brought me to my thinking about why I moved to Nationwide, why I'm here, because over that whole period, I wanted to, live, I wanted to work for more and more purpose-led organizations, where it just is easier. It's in the nature of what you do. So I want to ask a question. How many people know what a mutual is? Malcolm's one person, anyone else? There? And people from Nationwide. Anyone else know what a, a mutual is? I can guess, but that's about it. Oh my gosh, I, I, I am sure. Okay, well, I, I, I'm kind of I'm glad I'm here because I can do a bit of um, education. So a mutual is um, an organization like Nationwide which doesn't have shareholders, okay? That's probably the, the easiest way of, of thinking about it. It doesn't have shareholders. We're owned by our members. Okay, so our members owners, we're different to a, to a bank from that point of view. And all of our profits are reinvested in the services that we provide, they're reinvested for our members, they're reinvested for the communities that we serve. And the, the uh, I guess the, the, the tip is in the, the name, building society, you know, we, we build society, that's, that's where it's come from. Um, and you know, in the 19th century, we existed so that people could build their own homes, that was the whole point of it from a heritage point of view. And in the 20th century, we moved to lending money so people could actually buy their own homes. And now in the 21st century, we're focusing on people being able to buy their homes, but equally being able to green their homes as we go forwards. And bringing this into our procurement decisions, we can ask ourselves, just like we do internally in the organization, we often say, what's right for the member? Is this the right thing we're doing for the member because we're owned by our members? We start to ask ourselves, is this sourcing decision right for our members? Is this procurement tender we're about to do right for our members? Is it, does it serve the community in the right way that's at the heart of what we're trying to do as an organization? Connecting our purpose and our culture you know, and it is easier when you're in an organization like Nationwide, as the people that you serve are also your stakeholders, um, and you just generally think beyond profit for profit's sake. But it's important to connect it and align up your actions to, to the sustainable culture that you want to, want to create. 
and do it in an authentic way. Okay, so connect it through. The examples that I gave earlier, you know, in my experience, working in pharmaceuticals, you can find a way to connect it. Or if you're working in IT and telecoms, you can find a way to connect with how people need to work remotely. As I say, it's easier here because of the, the setup that we have, but you can do it everywhere. So the first thing I think it's worth striving to do when creating a culture for sustainability is to really connect with your company's purpose and bring to life that sustainability in the context of what you need to do from a procurement and supply chain point of view. So that way, whatever you're doing, it fits completely with the strategy of the organization. You don't have to push water uphill, it's just working with it all the way through. This is a really interesting slide. Okay, so people want purpose. I know it's been banded around a lot since COVID and the pandemic, but IBM did this in 2021, so it's very recent. And it says two thirds of the people they surveyed are more likely to apply for and more likely to accept a job from an organization they consider to be socially or environmentally responsible. Right, two thirds of people. Not only that, but they're willing to do it at a lower salary. So you talk about, you know, we talk about the sort of cost of living right, increases, people moving on to greater salaries. This is a way of addressing some of those things. And in fact, whenever we have interviews, whenever there are people coming for our roles internally, this is the question I get asked the most. You know, people say, well, if, if we come and work for you, then how can we do more of this? Or what are you working on here that's interesting? How can I get involved? And um, we have great answers to that. So if you are looking for a role in a purpose-led organization, then please go speak to our team over there. We've got a couple of roles that are available right now, and they're also on the web. So I'll just plug that uh, for anyone that's looking to work for a purpose-led organization. So that once you've got that clear purpose that filters through everything you do, having some more tangible goals is the next step along the journey, right, to give clarity of focus. And I think, you know, one of the challenges we faced as a mutual over the years is that we just innately did this stuff, right? So we were just doing good work, and you could call it sustainable work now, wrapped up in the, the taglines that we have in, across the ESGs, but it was just happening anyway. And we realized this, and we weren't representing ourselves well enough. So. In 2019, we um, launched our responsible uh, business uh, report. Um, and in 2019, we conducted a materiality assessment of the environmental, social, and governance issues that we wanted to connect with that were most important to our members and our colleagues, um, investors, and our key suppliers. And this led to our commitments, which you can see here on the slide. And these are the things that, that we focus on uh, in the society. So we believe everyone should have a place fit to call home and should have the confidence of managing their money. And as such, we've got these five, um, five areas. So let me just run through, through them to, to give you a feel, and then I'll talk about how we connect it into the, into the procurement team. So first of all, helping achieve safe and secure homes for all. This remains, remains absolutely the core of our business activities, as well as our broader, broader contribution to the society. And we're particularly focused at helping first-time buyers on their, on their buying journey and own their homes by addressing key, barri key barriers. Deposits, affordability, one in five people in the UK rent their homes. So the other thing that we're actively looking at is ensuring that something in the rental sector works well for tenants as well as landlords. And um, we've launched some propositions around that with the Landlord Works. Second area, leading the greening of UK homes. Hugely important for us, and we'll hear much more about that through the summit over the next couple of days. We do not invest our members' money in fossil fuels, and we've got a commitment to lead the greening of the nation's homes, which includes a pledge to have by 2030 50% of our mortgage book on EPC C gradings or, or rated or, or better. That means that we'll need supplies that can retrofit homes that we can offer to our members in terms of like forward looking, but also backward looking on our mortgage book. You know, UK homes account for around 20% of uh, emissions in the UK. And, and to be frank, the only way that we're going to meet our climate uh, pledge targets 
you know, that were set at COP26 that, that we're talking about is by almost reducing that to, to zero, you know, from a, from a carbon point of view. So it's hugely important. So we're campaigning for policy change, but also our own purchasing goods and services. Supporting our members' financial well-being is incredibly important. And we're helping members to build good savings habits through our save day and pay day propositions and protecting them from scams uh, in the financial, financial space. Again, our supply chain is there to, to back that up and to also provide some of those services. And championing thriving communities. So we continue to build from communities through our branch promise and through colleague and community grants. And we're supporting UK housing related projects. And finally, reflecting diversity of our society, we want our culture to be inclusive, allow everyone to thrive and absolutely reflect the societies that we serve. Okay, it goes without saying. And there are various projects across the organisation that support this. I'm personally involved in, in IND um, internally where we do, uh, we put in place personal goals on, um, and, and, and do a lot of work on unconscious bias. And we're also building that out into our supply chain through MSD UK partnerships and looking at our minority suppliers. So that's kind of at a nationwide level. And then how do we make it relevant for our team? So we've then taken the time to look at that and drop down to the mutual good commitments that we want in the supply chain. We thought about the topic quite carefully. So what are the things we're going to focus on? Helping to achieve safe and secure homes for us is about addressing modern slavery. It was mentioned a little earlier by Oliver and Malcolm, and it is shocking. There are more people in slavery today than there have ever been at any time. Right, just think about that. Absolutely shocking. It happens in all supply chains, technology, garments, agriculture, logistics, you know, it's all over the place. If, I think if anybody thinks it's not happening where they are, then you know, you're, you're sort of kidding yourself. And the victims are, uh, are victims of exploitation, right? They don't have safe, secure homes. Mm. So combating modern slavery through our procurement practices, we hope to contribute to an end of that and ensure people do have safe, secure homes and jobs. So to address this, we're doing things like strengthening our onboarding process, our due diligence, working with charities like Unseen, who are a modern slavery charity, to train our teams and to assess our supply base. Leading the greening of UK homes. You know, it's decarbonising our supply chain, seeking to buy lower carbon goods, scope one, two and three, and also strengthening our due diligence and environmental reporting. We're working with carbon intelligence to get a better understanding of our procured ambitions. And now we've got several sustainability schedules in our contracts. So we've started to put them in place. And some of our biggest tenders that we've uh, undertaken this year have some of those schedules in the contracts themselves. Supporting members' financial wellbeing. For us, that's about paying with real living wages, prompt payment code, doing the right thing in terms of how we pay our suppliers and expecting them to do the same as they onward transact. And championing thriving communities filters down into procurement by supporting other purpose-driven business areas. So participating in the Bisocial Corporate Challenge uh, run by Social Enterprises UK. And as an organisation, we are hugely driven by social purpose. So that, that you know, absolutely resonates with us. I'm really proud of our social enterprise relationships. The very recent ones that we've had in place are so Bilu Water, uh, Change Please Coffee, um, hey Girl Sanitary Products, Scottish Braille, um, Press Braille Communications, many more of our SME organisations that we're working with are social enterprises, right? So just, you're just putting your money in the place where you're doing some, some um, absolute, absolute good and it resonates with the society. We want to work with more with more of them, directly or indirectly. So through our tenders, we ask our tier ones to do that um, on our behalf as well. And reflecting diversity of society means creating inclusivity within our procurement team and the society, but also within the suppliers that we're dealing with. So through our tenders, again, we're asking our suppliers to take on um, uh, some of those contributions and certainly assess what they're doing. And we're also promoting the work that we're doing through organisations such as MSD UK um, and working with some of our big resourcing partners on what we can do in that space. 
So I completely believe that bringing your company's social purpose and sustainability goals into procurement and giving them a real sourcing and supply chain lens is the thing that can give you focus, but also start to create that culture of sustainability, right? And move you towards objectives. These focus areas are built into our scorecard. So that's the next step. So you kind of have them and then in the scorecard that I have, that my team have, that we distribute across the organization, there are balanced measures of cost reduction, cost avoidance, all of the classic things you would do as a procurement function, including risk. And then we have these things in there as well. Okay, social enterprises, minority suppliers, paying them on time, and they're all equally weighted. It's not like you just, you know, cost is up here and they're down there, they are the same. That helps hold me to account. It helps hold my team to account, and it allows us to sort of year on year show that improvement that Malcolm and Oliver were talking about. So making it personal, On the first World Sustainability Procurement Day, 21st of March, um, I asked every person in the team to set their own Procurement for Mutual Good personal goal. Okay. So we talked about the top down, but this was about taking it back to that personal connection again. What's the one thing that you're gonna do this year that is a goal for you, right? No one's gonna judge you. It's like you've got the scorecard metrics, but what's the thing? Because everyone's on a different part of the journey. If you've never done anything, it might be reading an article about it, or it might be coming to a conference like this or doing the webcast. And if you've done loads on it, it might be, well, you know what? That next big tender I'm going to do, I'm going to work with the business to put 10%, 20%, whatever it is, as a weighting on some of these measures. So you're personally pushing the dial of what you do. And that's about creating cultural shift. Right? So it's not the report of what needs to go up and get looked at on a monthly and quarterly basis. It's a cultural shift of people having their own goals on this topic. We also had um, a chance in the society at the end of 2021, and we will do it again as a team, to have something called Little Conversations, which is where it's a time to sort of talk, and it's, it's well needed after COVID, about you know, what's your personal passion, your personal drive, and how does that connect to the organization? What are the things that are important to you? And as a procurement team, we did that, just like everyone else in society, and it's an opportunity to connect back with some of these things um, that are driving people to come to work and wanting to be there. And learning together and leading by example, that none of this can be done without continuous learning, right? So to these two days are a learning for all of us. It's an absolutely important part of building the right culture for sustainability. And everyone's got different le differences in, in levels and awareness that they're starting with. Training has been a big focus for us, and we've had to do a lot of it virtually. But partnerships for us are also really important, right? Learning and drawing on the um, knowledge of these organizations that are around us. And, and things that we've done this last year, partner with Unseen to provide anti-slavery training, train the team on EcoVardis and supply sustainability tools, invited procurement budget holders and colleagues to meet the supplier events run by MSD UK, Social Enterprise UK, ran circular procurement workshops with colleagues in business and the community, promoted climate change training across the society, had presentations from some of our partners at our All Hands events or conferences, for example, MSD UK or Social Enterprise. And we've even held trainings with our partners on the same. So we've taken it out to them to talk to them about the same topics. And our annual partner event, where we shared our priorities with our key suppliers, and we do that up to CEO level, we spoke about this topic at great length. Okay, so we're, the key thing we're talking to them is about delivery, but also this. And another way I'm personally showing my commitment to the agenda is by putting myself, myself as a gatekeeper, which might do to my team's distress um, when we're onboarding suppliers and putting them in place. If, if the suppliers don't meet the thresholds of the criteria that we're looking at in this space, then they come through to me via the responsible business team for final approval before they can go on. So again, just taking operational steps to adjust what we think OK is. So it leads me on to partnerships and collaboration. And um, you know, in the supply chain, it's, absolutely, it's, it's really important that 
this isn't a buyer and supplier relationship anymore. It's about collaboration between the organisations that we work with. And as I said earlier, at our last annual partner event, um, we spoke about this hugely. And in fact, I'm really pleased to say that you know, the picture that you see there on the left is the award to our annual partner uh, winner this year. And it's an organisation called Switched, who won our partner shield. And Switched have been working with us to provide solar panel installation to our members and also help them switch energy. Right? So small organisation that we've collaborated with and worked with over quite a period of time. And they won this year out of all of our suppliers, our best supplier at the, uh, at the Arthur Webb um, Awards. Again, suppliers, the community that you're working with, they see that, right? That collaboration, they see what good looks like in the supply base. And we too, just another plug, we also won uh, this year, SIP's, Malcolm's looking at me, SIP's Best Sustainability Project for the year. Um, and we've also, just so you know, Malcolm, we've put in uh, Best Collaboration on that one we switched as well for winning this year. So we, are, we have our fingers crossed. But as he tells me, he has nothing to do with the judging. Yeah. Right, so to summarise, um, uh, sustainable, uh, making models sustainable and linking to clear purpose beyond profit. Filter down what you have from those goals into commitments that you can then take into your procurement team. Make it personal, help your colleagues make it personal, keep learning, and leaders should lead. Right? Leaders need to do the right thing and, and walk the talk uh, to embed this as, as we go forwards. And absolute collaboration, we can't do this alone, this is a global problem, so working together days like this are, are super important.